Hi, this is Tanya Becker, and I'm your host for today's episode of Parts You Exchange Talks Boating. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Parts You Exchange Talks Boating wherever you get your podcasts. Also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out on any content there either. Today, I'm joined by Jaron Wolsell, the president at Yak Gear. Yak Gear is an industry-leading supplier of kayak equipment, paddle sports accessories, and boat mounting accessories. Kayak fishing was growing rapidly in popularity well before the pandemic, but as everyone was looking for outdoor activities during the pandemic, the sport exploded. There are a lot of newer kayak anglers out there and the numbers are growing by the day. We're gonna talk about what anglers newer to kayak fishing need to think about as they outfit their kayaks. Thanks so much for being here, Jaron. Oh, thank you for having me. Good, it's gonna be a, f- I've been looking forward to our conversation. Um, Same here. Before- yeah, I mean, before we start really talking about outfitting kayaks, I wanted to get your take on the growing popularity of ki- popularity of kayak fishing. Why do you think the sport is growing so rapidly? Uh, I think it's several factors. I mean, one, it's easy to get into, way easier than, say, a boat, even though you can make your kayak as, about as complex as a powerboat can potentially be. Um, it's it's a very it's a very intimate thing. Uh, you can it's you've taken the boat, you've put it in, you're paddling, it's under your own power or pedaling. So, I mean, regardless, it's under your own power. And uh, you get to go to some places that power boats just, just necessarily can't get to. Um, so I think that's probably your main factors and uh, just cost. You know, yeah. there's, you're not in, you're not in 30 grand, you're not in 60 grand. Uh, even though you can rig boats up to try over $10,000, you know, despite the fact, but in a general sense, you're, it's a very cost effective way of uh, getting to go fishing and not just having to beat the bank. Yeah, that makes complete sense. So, all right, so let's talk about, you know, the core of what we're here to talk about today. You know, what are the basic areas folks need to think about as they're outfitting their kayak for, for the, you know, for the newer kayak angler? Sure. Um, first off, kind of what are you fishing for? You know, mm-hmm. what is your going to be your target species? Because uh, that can determine types of rod holders. That can determine, do you want to power your craft or not? Do, uh, you know, what kind of, yeah, I mean, that's be generally is what you're looking for. Um, there's other things is like, you know, with these kayaks come with mounting tracks all over it and different mounting surfaces. Where are you going to position your items? The, the tracks make it really easy as far as, you know, moving things back or back in the day with everything was hard mount. You need to know exactly where those things are going to go before you even place them. Um, and that can be hard to do before you even hit the water. Uh, tracks allow you a little bit more flexibility in that regard. So you can get in the craft, you can put your various mount on those tracks. And uh, you can slide them forward, back, wherever you need them, depending on what you're wanting to do. Uh, But those would be my two things is understand what we need basically to fish for what you're fishing for. And then determine, you know, also think of like, what are you fishing for? Right. Exactly. So you, I mean, there's some just core things you need, like a paddle, right? I mean, um, I would imagine there's a lot of different options there. Is that, is that true? That is true. And, you know, paddle in nowadays, it's more commonplace to even see with fishing uh, vessels that you're going to have pedal drive. Um, mm-hmm. That allows the angler to free up their hand. But mm-hmm. as far as paddle craft go, there's a lot, in my opinion, that's probably for paddle boats. That's the most ap- important piece of equipment you can potentially buy. Um, and the factors that you want to take into consideration is one, uh, the width of your boat. Mm-hmm. You also want to take into consideration how, how tall you are. Um, and then nowadays with how, you know, seats have changed in craft so much, these are elevated seats. So mm-hmm. back in the day when you were sitting down pretty much at water level, hips, even, even with the surface of the water, you get away with a shorter paddle. Um, nowadays, now that you've elevated, that help, that goes into consideration as well. So those are probably the number, like the three top things to think about when you're considering a paddle. The other thing that you want to look at is what is the paddle constructed of? Um, I always tell people, get the lightest weight paddle you can afford. Um, you know, that's like if, if you were going off-roading in a vehicle, 
your tires are probably your most important piece of equipment to go along with that. So you want to get the most comprehensive tire for what you're going to drive through that you can afford. Uh, paddle is the same thing. It's what makes your boat go other than you. Um, and you can go down a slippery slope with paddles. You can go paddle shape uh, because you've got various ones that, you know, determine how you're going to paddle. Uh, for me, uh, when I used to go out aggressively and do this kind of fishing, I had a, what you consider a high angle paddle and it moved maximum amount of water. It, uh, it required a more aggressive stroke. Uh, the other the other shape is you're going to have is touring paddles, and that's a little bit easier going on the paddler. Uh, the blade isn't as broad, so it's not pushing as much water, a little bit more leisurely fashion. And you can get away with a lot lower paddle stroke, like a lower angle paddle stroke. Um, but I always recommend carbon. If you can find a carbon fiber paddle, uh, be that whether it's a just the only the shaft is carbon fiber, or the full paddle itself is uh, constructed of that material. Perfect example is what uh, Werner and Bending Branches crank out on their higher end spectrum. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. It's interesting the shape of the paddle too. That makes that makes a ton of sense, and um, it might you know depend upon number one you know how far you're gonna you you want to go right. I mean I, I would think a paddle yeah. that displaces more water you would want to get to the point where you could get there a little faster. I mean, if that's well, at least at your goal. Yeah. It, it, the only thing to take into consideration there is just wear and tear on yourself. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, the higher, the higher angle paddles, when you've got to get real vertical, scrape the side of the boat, almost uh, you're going to burn some calories and some, you're going to build up some lactic acid in those muscles for sure. <laughs> uh, it, but it does allow you to cover more water. Um, mm -hmm. I just probably not as effectively as say a low angle touring style blade, which you can, you can still move water with, but it's going to be easier on you and your longevity throughout the day is going to be a little bit, a little bit better. Gotcha. Gotcha. Good. So that I, I think gives some people some ideas to what to think about, you know, when they're, when they're selecting a paddle. So some kind of anchoring device is needed, right? I mean, how mm -hmm. should people um, best approach that? Well, uh, it, it comes back down to just like with the boat. What are you, where are you going to go mostly? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it used to be, again, using my past experience, you know, it used to be just you had one style anchor and it's just the old school clunky metal style anchors. <laughs> yeah. And you can, you, you can find them in various sizes and shapes for, you know, based off of what you're going to be doing. But nowadays you throw in more of the complexity you've got. Uh, stake out sticks, which are shallow water ankles, just anchors that are just a pole. Um, you've got, uh, which is kind of the same concept, but you've got power pole makes the micro skiff anchor. Uh, mm -hmm. Those install on the backs of the boat and just a power anchor that goes down. Um, it all just comes down to where are you going to be? If, if you're going to be, say, here on the Texas coast, you know, coastal flat, I would recommend a I would recommend a stake out stick over anything. Uh, they store along the side of the boat. You can put them in your paddle holders. They get out of the way. Uh, you don't have a big clunky anchor. You pull in. It's got mud all in it, and it gets all inside your boat. And then that's another thing you got to clean. Um, but if you are offshore or anything in that regard, uh, you can still use those style anchors. You can use a one and a half pound, a three pound uh, grapnel style anchor. Uh, we use when we fished offshore a long time ago. We would use 2.2 pound Bruce anchors. And that also depends though, like what kind of substrate is at the bottom of the seafloor. We have a lot of mud. So those Bruce anchors work really well. Hard sand, you probably want to use something more of like the grapnel style or potentially even a Danforth style anchor. Got those two big wings that move independently. Right. Right. Um, but uh, shoot, even nowadays uh, you can use electronics to uh, anchor your boat in a position. You can use anything like those that have spot lock, all of the fish, or what are they called, trolling motors? Yeah. They've got mm -hmm. spot lock, and they're all GPS-based. So as right. soon as you hit that lock button, it's going to do a good job of keeping you or in that position. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, just like anything else, what are you doing, mm -hmm. where are you fishing, and how deep is that water? Absolutely. And people also use um, your your um, fishing in a kind of a brushy area, brush grips or something like that to um, to 
kind of stay in place, right? Yeah, that that's a that's been something that's been around for a really long time. Uh, just never really was thought as potentially say a a kayak anchor style system. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's guys around the country that have you know been in canoes or P-rows or what anything like that, and they've used them. So it's mm -hmm. not unknown, but it's mm -hmm. not as widely known as it is now. Uh, what I like them for is when I get up into a body of water and I want to be real quiet, other than a stakeout pole, if I don't have one. Uh, say like you know I'm on a reservoir and I'm during the spawn and I want to I want to target fish that are up shallow, holding in certain areas, and typically on a shoreline in some of these Texas reservoirs, you've got access to uh, you got button brush, you've got trees, you've got anything along those lines, and you just clip on and kind of float off and, uh, you know, hold your position while you're looking at those fish and targeting them. But, yeah, it, it's a good option. Uh, it's even a good option just to clip it on, and, uh, cleat it onto your boat, and then, you know, you know, shore yourself and go take and go eat lunch, do whatever you want to do. Uh, right. But, yeah. Exactly. And it sounds to me like, I mean, the, the areas that you can um, – reach with kayaks are, you know, much more diverse than, than, than with a power boat. So you might want to have a couple of these options in your boat, depending upon, you know, where you end up. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So here's the, here's the other area I, I find interesting is, is tackle organization. You know, I think <laughs> this, for people that aren't familiar with kayak fishing i mean really people use like milk crate style crates you know as the basis of the organization system by large it just seemed kind of kind of seems kind of funny to me if you're not familiar with the sport but <laughs> how <laughs> so it, it it is the kind of the core of the organizational system kind of a milk crate style thing i mean what is this like yeah it has been for a really long time uh i remember back early when i was working in a kayak shop you know you'd have guys come in it, it was there was no centralized, you know, tackle organization device in those days. It mm -hmm. was these guys would come in and literally they're going behind a 7-Eleven grabbing a milk crate and they're putting it in the back of their boat and they bring it in with them. And then it's then it got to the point where, OK, we're putting our tackle boxes in here, but we want additional storage. So then they start bolting rod holders onto the side and what's not. Uh, Luckily, we have progressed quite a bit since those days, and there are a lot more options than just, say, the milk crate, which is still prominent for all beginners because mm -hmm. um, they don't know what necessarily what feature set they're looking for in a product. I just need something to put my stuff. I'm not going to bring, uh, you know, just my boxes and throw them in the tank while the kayak and be done with it. You, it's a water sport. You're going to get water mm -hmm. in that area. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. um, and a lot of them still aren't, you know, waterproof boxes. But uh, what a milk crate or um, anything else that's out on the market that resembles a milk crate, uh, you can, you're, you're easily able to put all of your boxes in a certain pattern. Um, you're able to get rod holders that come with it. Some of them come with anchoring the positions on it already. Uh, the upper end versions allow you to uh, really customize angle of the rod holder, anything else that you want to install in that pack that, you know, eases your day. Uh, shoot, uh, there's even the soft-sided stuff that is out on the market today takes into consideration sometimes kayak anglers, and they'll put a waterproof style bottom so it doesn't seep up through the device. Uh, you can get those at your all of your major retailers across the country, Academy, Bass Pro, it doesn't matter. Um, you can even take scupper plugs and just put them in the back of your tank well. Uh, that kind of blocks any water coming up from under the boat not over the top, but I mean, you shouldn't be getting a lot back there anyway, other than paddle splash. Um, that allows you to get a little bit more differentiated. You can use those style packs where it's basically tackle first, angler second, you know, like it just kind of broadens your spectrum of things that you're allowed to go buy. Uh, yeah. Never, it never used to be that way. I, I'm, I'm very appreciative that these larger companies, the Planos of the world, they're, they recognize how important kayak angling is to the overall industry, and they they create things and solutions that help supplement that angler's experience on the water. That's great. And I, I know Yak Gear, I believe you offer three different kind of crate kits. That's correct. Right. Um, and what are the differences? I mean, they're they're all kind of milk crate based. You know, mm -hmm. it looks kind of like a milk crate, fancy milk crate. For sure. um, what is the difference? You know, as you move up the the um, 
to a higher end, to higher level? Yeah. Uh, well, plain and simple, we offer just the base milk crate. Mm -hmm. uh, you you can buy just the the bone stock crate yourself. Mm -hmm. Allows you to customize whatever you want on it, other than having a preset number of options. Um, when you go up from there in our assortment, uh, we have a starter crate. Starter crate gives you a accessory pouch that bolts onto the side. It's just a mesh pouch, uh, so drains water if it gets in there. Um, comes with two rod holders uh, or a set of rod. I believe it's two, and that allows you to store your extra rods in the back instead of using the stock bone ones that are on the kayak already. Um, and then when you move up from there, we have a basic crate, which just kind of elaborates on the overall product. And you get three rod holders, you get uh, the accessory pouch, you get an anchor, you get two uh, rod leashes or gear leashes, however you want to use them. Uh, just gives the angler, angler a little bit more uh, right out of the gate. Gotcha. Cool. That's, that, that's, uh, look, they look really, they look really super helpful. Um, yeah, it, 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 we, our customers, it's a really easy option when you go to a store and say, hey, I want a milk crate, but I don't want just the crate itself. I want a little bit more customization that helps me on the water. It's okay. just a grab and go solution. And mm -hmm. you can, you can grow from there. You don't have to get rid of the crate. You can go and still buy additional accessories from, you know, yetgear.com and throw whatever you need on there. It, it's, it just gives you a, it just gives you a starting point. Yeah, no, absolutely. And much easier than trying to rig up old school, all these weird things to like an actual milk crate. <laughs> yeah, know? it, 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 you know, our company's mm -hmm. built with the employees that are all, we're all paddlers. We've been mm -hmm. there. We've done that. We, we just kind of came together. What's a good, what's a good subset of accessories to give someone who's brand new wants to go fishing? Uh, what do we need to give them to get them started? At least give them not so much a blank slate, but a literally a starting point. Uh, and that's just been a great program for us. Uh, we've been received well. Um, it's, and that just gets our customers to come back and, you know, ask us, hey, what else can I do here? Yeah, absolutely. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is safety. Um, you know, I think, I mean, I hopefully people realize that a kayak is a U.S. Coast Guard regulated vessel. I hope mm -hmm. people realize that. I mean, so right. just from a, from a, 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 I guess, letter of the law standpoint, it is. Mm -hmm. um, but the, um, the, I mean, the other thing is obviously just, core safety. I mean, and I think, you know, most of the U.S. Coast Guard regulations are, are obviously designed with safety in mind. I mean, they're not just made up out of thin air. Right. Um, so what, um, you know, what is required of people to, ha to have on board a kayak? Um, so first off, you've got to have your PFD, number mm -hmm. one. And mm -hmm. it has to be, in, like in Texas, it has to be either on or within arm's reach and easily acceptable or uh, easily accessed, excuse me. Yeah. Um, you know, it, I'm a huge advocate uh, PFD wise. Uh, there's been, it always seems like whenever you, you're in the sport and you're, you say you're subscribed to all the various social media pages or any of the outdoor journals, it always seems like there is a story out there that paddlers fell off their boat. They couldn't get back to them. Um, and they've unfortunately become a statistic. It's, mm -hmm. it's a bad situation. Uh, I'm a huge advocate. It doesn't matter what depth of water you're in ankle deep. Uh, I think you should have your PFD on at all times, regardless. It does not matter. Uh, I would, I don't take mine off until I've shored my boat and I've stepped out. Um, that's just me. You can call me, you know, anal retentive if you want, but <laughs> I only, I've only got one life. So yeah. you know, no need to waste it in that kind of regard. Um, so yeah, PFD is required. Uh, if you're going to be paddling in low light or no light conditions, you've got to have a safety light. Uh, and then if you've got a if you've got a power craft where you've added a motor to your kayak, you even have to have the red and uh, red and green navigation lights on the boat. Uh, um, yeah. So and you know like Railblazer has a lot of solutions for that. You know. Some of those powered craft, you can buy a starport, you can put the uh, IPS light in the bow of the boat and, you know, you're covered there. 
Uh, we also have a solution from Rawblazer that is the visibility kit. It's uh, it's up on a pole. It comes up three feet off the deck of the boat, and they're all in, uh, they're screwed sections. There's three sections, so you can collapse it all down. Uh, but that, by Coast Guard regulations, it needs to be able to be seen two nautical miles. And it's mm -hmm. just a white light, um, so they require that. Um, you have to have a safety whistle, a signaling device. Uh, it's either that B8 whistle itself, or uh, it can be, if I'm not mistaken, it can be a flare. Don't quote me on that. Um, but something to signal to other craft that, hey, I'm here, or hey, I need help. Uh, those are the three main things that you have to have. Yes. Yeah. We've done some um, content, and I can, I can link it in the show notes for people. The, um, the Coast Guard regulated... Uh, you know, lighting devices, flares. There are some electronic flares that are, are uh, U.S. Coast Guard approved, but they have to be very specific. So I, I can right. link that information for people. Well, um, the other the other piece of it, the other piece of equipment that's not necessarily uh, demanded by the Coast Guard, and but I think it's absolutely important to to have is just a safety like our uh, first aid kit. Yeah. Keep it on you, um, especially if you're a fisherman. You get embedded with a hook or Something happens, whatever. Um, here in Texas, it it comes down to even if you step out of your kayak in the shallows, you could be stepping on an oyster reef, you could be doing something mm -hmm. like that, and um, that's going to impact, you know, slicing your feet up. But if you don't have anything to clean it out with, you're running your risk of all sorts of different problems. You mean flesh-eating bacteria, just general mm -hmm. infection, all of that. Um, and so when when I fished, I kept a safety kit on me at all times, first aid, and also kept diluted um, bleach water to help disinfect. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I wouldn't that recommend pouring well. pouring bleach on an open wound, but yeah, if no. you dilute it, <laughs> I was like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you dilute it though, it, if you dilute it, it, does kill more. It's 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 better than nothing, and it's gonna mm -hmm. it's gonna kill the majority of the infection before anything. It's just a pre treatment. Yeah. Yeah. I um, may be a little bit more comfortable to people than bleach. I, I do. I, I, I love to fish, but I also do a lot of um, trail running and, and hiking. Um, yeah. And I and I like never I never like you. I, I don't I don't go anywhere without a. I mean, anywhere on the trail. I don't go without a first aid kit because you right. fall, you know, whatever um, in new skin. That's like a little team. You can get a little travel size, you know, spray, you know, to right. spray on a on a open wound that to yep. protect it until and just disinfect it until you can get back to absolutely you know, it, 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 civilization. It's got, you just take in the beauty about a first aid kit is you can tailor it to your needs you can get about as simplistic one as you need in, for under mm -hmm. 10 bucks just yeah. throw it in a dry bag or somewhere that it's accessible on the boat that you can get it in a you know, fairly quick manner and yeah. you can or you can go all the way up and get crazy with what you want yeah exactly I usually, I usually hand assemble the first aid kit, you know, just put different things in a little, um, yeah, but, you can throw uh, it in your tackle organization. Uh, that's you can right. do that. That's so. right. Absolutely. So there's also some decisions to be made around, you know, just like kind of your fishing setup, right? Obviously rod holders, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think people need to think about fish handling devices a little bit differently than you think about them on a power boat because you're, you're tippy on a kayak, right? You kind of need things that are. It can you, be, you yeah, know. absolutely. Um, so, you know, what should people be thinking about on, on this front? Um, well, I mean, it's been around for quite a while, tried and true. They're a little expensive, but you can get Boga grit. That's something that started over in Florida. It's stainless, a uh, little overkill for, you know, say inland fishing for bass or whatnot. Mm -hmm. But I mean, number one, a net. Get a net, uh, especially if you're using any lures that have treble hooks or whatnot. Not saying that you can't get stuck with a singular hook, but when you've got a moving boat, a moving angler, and a moving fish, and you're trying to secure it with your hand, uh, <laughs> a, a net's a little bit easier. You, you can straddle your legs out to the side of the boat and just kind of drop the net with the fish in it right in front of you and use your pliers and work from there. Um, net, for sure. There's uh, other devices out there like fish grip. Um, by the fish grip that's the company name um you can find those at all your major retailers too and in various various forms a whole bunch a slew of companies create something just like the original uh so you can find walmart you can find them at specialty shops they're cheap uh, the beauty about them is it secures the fish on, on their jaw 
It doesn't tear a hole through like some of the metal devices do, or uh, shouldn't most of the time, um, depending on where you pinch them. But that allows you to secure the fish, keep your hand away from the lure, and to still allow you to pull out the hook wherever you need to. And on top of that, if you ever drop them overboard for one, like, at least a fish grip, uh, they float. So you're not going to lose oh, your nice. piece of equipment or, or shouldn't lose your piece of equipment or make it easy to go and retrieve. Um, uh, I mean, you can, there's some hokey devices out there too. You can get gloves with rubber palms on them. Uh, I don't really use that because I find the hooks get stuck in the material. Um, but yeah, I would say for, if you're con seriously considering securing your fish, net a fish grip device of some type, use those two pieces and that helps. It'll help you uh, eliminate any hooking or reduce. Yeah, got you. And I mean, people are um, just like power boats or any other kind of vessel these days. I mean, people are tricking out kayaks with you know all kinds of electron with varying levels Everything. of electronic electronics, yeah. right? Um, yeah. <laughs> so you know what what do you think are, is the base kind of electronic capability that um, that folks should have? Um. Well, I mean, again, what are you doing? Uh, on the coast, when I talk to people about fish finders, like, well, I'm only fishing in like, you know, two foot or less of water. Why would I need a fish finder? And like, well, actually, the most important piece of that equipment is the GPS that's on it, uh, especially if it has track. Some of them in the early days didn't have tracking ability. It just showed you where you were. Mm -hmm. uh, the nice thing about GPS is this can be from anywhere, anywhere along the uh, Gulf of Mexico, uh, it can be at the eastern seaboard. It can be anywhere in California because, you know, like they have the delta over there. Uh, those are winding bodies of water. You can easily get turned around real quick, and then you don't know how to get back to your boat launch. Um, it all, I've always, my wife is the exact same way. It's always, it's always easy to get to where you're going because you're not <laughs> worried about it. You're still fresh. Yeah, you're just like, yeah. <laughs> but then before you know it, you could be two, three, five, seven miles away from where you launched. And you could be, the last thing you want to do is waste energy and time on trying to recreate your steps if you don't have a GPS. So on those smaller units that, you know, you can buy starter units, I think for like 99 bucks at mm -hmm. most of your sporting goods retailers. That's right. If you've got basic GPS on there, that takes all the guesswork out. Yeah. Like you can just go to where you're going, use the tracking on it, and then retrace your steps all the way back home. Yeah. Um, so I would think that's a basic piece of equipment. Now, as you go up from there, where you're going to see most of it prevalent is bass fishing, for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. These guys are highly detailed in what they're looking for. So be it just 2D sonar going down, uh, all the way out to uh, down scan, side scan, looking for structure. And then nowadays you're seeing it, you're seeing it grow exponentially is actually the live scope so it's a it's a transducer that it can either look out or down and you can literally see the fish swimming in the structure right. so it, the other things are trolling motors are getting huge um it, it used to be nothing to just bolt on a simple trolling motor and go but nowadays it i'm going to use this as my main source of propulsion or I'm going to supplement me pedaling to the place and then I'll put on a bow mount trolling motor just like the deck of the bass boat. And I can spot lock, I can pre-program my course to run a certain stretch of structure or shoreline. Um, it's gotten extremely complicated. I know several of my friends that do fish competitively, they probably have over $10,000 in electronics wrapped up into their $3,000 boat. Because uh, yeah. it just all depends on how in depth that you are within that sport. Uh, some of these guys on the bass circuit, they could probably crush people when you put them in a power boat. That's how good they are. But they choose to sh they choose to fish from a kayak. But they want the same electronics capability. So you'll see them double stack fish finders. One's 2D sonar or GPS. The other one is their live scope. Um, it's getting pretty complex. Not to mention the fact that. You're in a lot of those tournament series, they allow motor propulsion. So mm -hmm. you'll get specific trolling motors that are mounted to the rear of the boat to propel them to where they're going, which increases their range. Whereas yeah. they used to only go four to five miles out. Now they're going nine, 11, 
15 miles away from launch position, and then they can make it way back. That's right. Good. Interesting. So the, the other kind of final, like, basics category that I would, um, you know, I think people need to think about is, is storage and transportation. Um, you know, how, how are people going to be transporting the thing? I mean, you know, what are some right. of the options and things to think about there? Uh, that's going to come down to really what kind of boat you have. Um, right. Nowadays, the most common size on the market is 12 feet and probably somewhere between 33 and 36 inches wide. That's a big craft. And typically, the the weights follow with those dimensions. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a 12-foot boat, but when you've got the seat and all the other components that go along with it, you're talking a boat that's in excess of 100 pounds. Um, mm -hmm. In the past, these boats were much lighter, longer. You could get, a, like, when you go home, you could easily put them on your wall and say a J-style rack or just a kayak rack in general. Um, nowadays, that's not possible. With the weight of those boats, it'll compress down on those and it can deform the boat. Um, so you kind of got to keep that in mind. Uh, for home storage for the larger boats, you can get a set of kayak stands. You can make sawhorses. You can, with, you can actually cut them out and make dips to follow the contour of the bottom of your boat. Um, that's probably the most common way people do that stuff. Uh, one thing you never want to do when you're at home, though, is leave the boat out in the open. Uh, we, you've seen people put them in their backyards, the sides of the houses. They're out in the UV, and these are polyethylene boats. There's a there's a natural oil to that act, to that plastic, and being out in the UV can actually extract some of that oil. Uh, they can make the plastic brittle, um, so you never want to store outside. Always store covered or inside your garage if possible. Um, as far as transporting boats, um, if you've got, say, a sedan or something of that type, uh, there are various companies out there that make roof racks for your vehicles. Yakima and Thule are probably the number one and two uh, in no order. Uh, but they do make, even for the larger boats, they make racks that can come down off the side of the boat. You put it on there, and then it raises it back onto the vehicle and locks. And then you just secure the bow and stern, and you're good to go. Uh, the most common place that you'll probably see with kayaks is just a truck bed. Um, mm -hmm. That makes it really easy to slide it in and out. Uh, it doesn't matter the length of the bed because there's there's various pieces of equipment that allow you to elongate how much support the boat gets from the cab to the tailgate. Um, Boondocks makes a really good, uh, I, think, I can't remember what it's called, but uh, basically what they've done is Instead of a 90 degree angle at the back of the rack, they've curved it so that way your departure angle when you're going down certain steep banks or anything like that, even boat launches, it won't scrape and drag. Uh, I've had those old 90 degree angle ones before and they do their job perfectly, but you can bottom them out depending on where you go. Um, but all those racks allow you to do is put the nose of the boat right there on the back of the J and slide it all the way in and then you just strap it down. You're good to go. That, that's your most common transportation. Uh, the, there's other various ty types of racks that above your truck bed, uh, above the cab of your truck, uh, pretty much anything. And then various holders, like J-style holders that can go on the top to help load and transport your boat to where you want to go. Gotcha. And then what about once you're at the, the boat launch, um, you know, uh, mechanisms to help you, you know, kind of easily <laughs> transport it to the, to the launch, right? Yeah, so I mean, there's a various there's a various amount of kayak carts that are on the market. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, some uh, manufacturers like Feel Free, they've they've built a wheel into the rear keel of the boat, and you can oh. slide it out and pick up the nose and you know roll it right down to the boat launch. Because the last thing you want to do is drag them. Because it's yeah, again, it's plastic. You're gonna shred it like you would with a cheese grater. So yeah. it's that's the last thing you want to do because that's that's just a headache. Um, mm -hmm. But my always recommended one is a cart. The cart makes it super easy. And there are, there are so many kayak cart options on the market. Um, you can have them where they're built into the boat where they pull out, fold down, and then you can roll it to the water. Or you can put them under the craft, strap them on and go through, or even go through the scuppers and go down. Um, gotcha. we, sell a, we sell a variant here called the Sea Tug, I'm sure, if you've done your research in the kayak market or you are already in that uh, that industry, you've heard of the Sea Tug. It's probably the most versatile cart on the market. And the fact that 
while other carts, when you get to the water, you've got to take them off or take them, take them out of the scuppers. And then you got to go walk all the way back to your truck or your vehicle, store them, and then come back. Not many can go in the boat. Uh, the sea tug actually breaks apart. There's only one metal component on that on that cart itself, and that's just the ac- the through axle. Um, so once you've broken the pieces down, you and it takes less than ten seconds. You can just throw it in one of the uh, if you've got room inside your boat. Open one of the hatches, throw the cart inside, close it. You're good to go. Come back from your done. Come back when you're done fishing. Reassemble in the same manner, and throw it on the bottom boat go up it's very time efficient um nice and that with it only having one metal component you're not talking about seeing this thing uh degrade over time from say like rust or uh and you know as well as anybody if if, if the metal rust is going to break it it, it just yeah it shouldn't be a consumable product this is a long-term option for anglers and we sell it with uh we sell with sand wheels as well so if you have like loose substrate you can actually pull it with the sand cart wheel and it'll pull just as easily as if you were pulling the normal cart over, say, concrete. Oh, wow. Oh, that's super helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, the last thing that I'll mention is something that's really basic, but it would be something that I could easily overlook is just a waterproof box <laughs> for your keys and wallet and phone yeah. or whatever. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and that's the beauty to that, too, is the... <laughs> There's so many different options that you want to do with. I, I, for me, what I typically do for a dry storage, I get a dry bag. Yeah. A dry bag, you can get them in, in, you know, you can get them in various sizes, all of, like two liter, all the way up to like fifty liter. Why you'd need yeah. that, I don't know. But yeah. uh, <laughs> a very but, big uh, phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a tablet. Uh, but no, I I like dry bags. Um, and typically, what I throw in those, my keys, wallet, absolutely, of course extra pair of clothes just say something bad happens keeps them dry and if you if you pack them appropriately you can compress them all the way down and it takes up minimal space in your boat um and you know there's there's hard boxes too uh, made by many of people the one i'm most familiar with are pelican boxes uh, they're they're a self-pressure regulating box and they're 100 percent waterproof they float uh yeah. just depending like i mean you're not going to put like weights in there and drop it and watch it float but <laughs> if you just throw your you throw wallet keys uh essentials um right. you know that's that's perfect uh typically honestly that's where my first aid kit goes because that's right <laughs> in my, well in my first aid kit i have fire starting material so that's ah. pretty essential to keep those dry yes. um but i i enjoy dry bags and plus they can clip onto various areas and get them out of the way uh, they're a little bit more flexible say than some of the hard box styles but the hard box styles are just as good as far as keeping your essentials dry. I like the dry bag option just because like you said, it's more flexible and I would highly think it'd be a very good idea to put your first aid kit in the dry bag. Cause not only fire starters, yeah. like wet bandages don't really work that well. Um, no, no. Let's just go down the list. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're basically, you're basically just throwing everything away at that point. <laughs> exactly. This was such a fun conversation. I mean, thanks so much for being here, Jaron. <laughs> no, thank you very much for having me on. It's good to always rehash my past and experiences from or at least and, that and, way. And what your your past experiences and what you're leading <laughs> now to help other people experience. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I'm I'm hoping over time that we can we can keep creating good products here, uh, get them out to the masses, and help them solve all sorts of uh, problems they potentially have on their boats. Great. If Partsview is proud to carry uh, Yakker's full catalog, including associated brands like Railblazer, Backwater Paddle Company, and Sea Tug, I encourage our listeners, or, our listeners to check out our offering. And I've included a link below. I also encourage everyone to go visit yakgear, yakgear.com. Um, you can buy Yakgear on their site as well. And there are a number of super helpful how to videos within the Yakgear TV section of the site. Um, and also your video, all your videos can be found on your YouTube channel. And I've included a link to the channel as well as your, um, Instagram and, and Facebook pages as well. So thanks again for being here. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the parts View exchange talks, boating podcast. Are you in a dock war with your boating neighbor for the cleanest boat? Check out our Marine soaps, polishes, waxes, and more at partsview.com. And for free shipping, Use the coupon code PVTALKSSHINE.
a special perk for our podcast listeners. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram for boating knowledge, to keep in touch with the Parts View community, and for special sales and promotions. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast, and check out the show notes for the coupon code just mentioned, more information about Parts View and the products we offer, as well as our boating blog, the Parts View Exchange. And a big thanks to Mind for performing the original music featured within this podcast.